which is how do we want to live? Do we want to live our lives in the ways that are, you know, we stipulated by this whole business of just considering the pandemic as the one phenomenon that dominates everything? A warm welcome to Mind the Shift, a podcast dedicated to discussing the shifting world. That may entail issues on a human scale as well as issues on a global scale. In this episode, we will talk about a phenomenon that is perhaps as global as it can get, the coronavirus pandemic. I am delighted to introduce Professor Sunetra Gupta, a theoretical epidemiologist at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on it. You and your team have come to conclusions about this pandemic that differ somewhat from many other camps, not least when it comes to our ability to develop immunity. Is it fair to say that you you question the general level of alarmism in this matter and uh, that you are critical to the harsh lockdown policies? Well, I mean, there's so many parts to this whole problem. It's difficult to um, address them all in in one um, sentence. So um, as such, the whole lockdown policy is one that I have had strong reservations about from the outset. Um, But as a scientist, I felt that my approach or any contribution I could make to the debate would be along the lines of, of creating a debate around the science to start with. So in March, we published, um, or put out there rather, a, a piece of work, a very simple model, which showed that there were a range of possible um, scenarios that could sort of underlie what we were observing by ways of deaths in different countries. and the, at that point, what the UK had been um, acting on was essentially a sort of worst case scenario. But in fact, the data were um, equally well fit by much more, um, much less, um, the public, I mean, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the, the data would equally well be fit by a scenario in which the likelihood of dying upon infection was much lower and indeed was also distributed across the population in a way that um, allowed different strategies like shielding the vulnerable. So Mm. I felt it was important, um, other members of my group as well felt it was important to have those scenarios on the table for people to consider before entering into this drastic step of lockdown. Mm. But of course, That's only one axis along which one can think, which is what happens to the epidemic. That is where I happen to have a level of expertise. So, of course, it's appropriate for me to comment on that. But I also have strong personal opinions about what the lockdown actually achieves and whether it's justified from a humanitarian point of view. And then there's another axis which I talk about, which is the third axis, which is the aesthetic axis, which is how do we want to live? Do we want to live our lives in the ways that are, you know, we stipulated by this whole business of just considering the pandemic as the one phenomenon that dominates everything? Mm. That is super interesting, really. And uh, I would like to come back to that, to those more philosophical questions around this. If we go back to the the concrete um, research that you are doing, your latest studies or study, perhaps I think it's pretty recent actually, show some very interesting things about how this pandemic seems to play out among us in terms of the anticipated rate of infections and uh, versus the actual rates and the possibility of some kind of an inherent immunity that isn't apparent as far as I understand. I, I hope that I have understood it fairly well there. Can you tell us more about this? these results? Absolutely. So, so the first uh, modelling exercise that we published was one which considered the population to be 
more or less homogeneous in terms of whether we got infected or not. So the only inhomogeneities that were in that model were to do with whether you died, so how vulnerable you were to severe disease and infection. And it, uh, at the time, I thought that, like flu and many other pathogens we know, that w- that most of us would be susceptible to infection, although there, it was already clear there were very significant differences between people in how they responded to infection. In other words, whether they got ill at all, whether they were asymptomatic, and whether they got so ill that they were at risk of death. So that those, because that's all we knew at that point. And if that's the case, in that very simple circumstance, then you should see, as the epidemic progresses, a lot of people uh, bearing marks of having been exposed to the virus. And so our overriding message at that point was, please, let's get the studies, the, the tools, let's refine the tools with which we can explore that. So if the only way we can tell whether this epidemic is really lethal or not is to establish, if you like, the denominator, how many people have actually already been exposed if the numerator is the deaths. So let's try and do that was the big message that we wanted or attempted to send out in March. And then um, in our research group, um, we managed to develop a particular tool to look for antibodies in the blood uh, of of people to see if they'd been exposed and had were able to neutralize the virus. Um, And meanwhile, other groups as well were developing these tests and also looking for other kinds of immune responses, such as T-cell responses. So it's a whole, obviously, array of responses that we produce when we encounter the virus. And, um, you know, several groups around the world were, were trying to dissect that. And what I was hoping at that point is that these antibody tests would serve as a, uh, you know, a, a, the purpose of telling us how many people had been exposed, that there'd be an easy equation there, as there is, I think, with influenza. So when we look at a population and test for, have you been exposed to flu, you get sort of 60, 70% or more, actually, mm. people exhibiting these antibodies. But in the case of COVID, and, you know, you learn about a virus as it unfolds. Every day. Day every by day. day. Exactly. So what we've started to, um, of, um, what, we, what we now know is that some people, some very nice work from the Karolinska showing that, you know, have, have these responses already in place, um, probably from previous exposure to other seasonal coronaviruses. That actually prevents... Yes, so maybe we should, we should uh, delve a little bit into that because many people mm-hmm. may not know that that uh, the, an ordinary cold that you get is is actually from a coronavirus. Is that is that correct? Well, some of, I mean, ordinary colds, that, that whole sort of catalogue of respiratory symptoms is caused by a number of viruses. There are things called rhinoviruses oh, yes. as well, and, and some of it may actually just be flu. So there's a whole list of, you know, there's a big list of viruses that cause respiratory symptoms, which we lump together into this phenomenon of, I've got a cold, or sometimes we say, I've had flu. Mm. And what we mean is what probably caused it is not influenza, but rather a coronavirus or a rhinovirus or respiratory syncytial virus. So we have a whole kind of roster of these things. Mm. And it is true that some of my my initial reaction to the emergence of this novel virus was that, oh, I'm sure most of us won't die from it because we already all have exposure to at least one of the four seasonal coronaviruses that we just regularly live with. So and was, was this something that, that not many other researchers, experts, uh, debaters uh, were talking about at that time? Were you kind of uh, talking about alone? it mm-hmm. at all? But this has been the basis of a lot of the work that I've been doing on, on, on other pathogens like flu. So a lot of my work is currently on influenza and uh, we're trying to make a new vaccine for influenza. And the basis of that vaccine is that you actually do get a lot of protection from 
exposure to previous strains of flu. Yes, I mean the fact. I mean the fact that we have been exposed to a, a, an array of uh, other coronaviruses, seasonal coronaviruses, before. I mean that seems to a layman that seems like uh, well something that you would take into account when you when you discuss whether this is going to be a very severe pandemic or not. Well, it was uh, certainly something that was it wasn't it wasn't something that was debated in the media in March, as far as I recall. No, it wasn't. It was certainly something that was um, very much in my thinking, just because, as I said, that is the general framework, if you like, theoretical framework that we apply to most pathogen systems in our group. Um, But, and indeed, at the moment, what we're engaged in is looking at immunity to other seasonal coronaviruses and how that interacts with, um, or how that modifies our response to um, uh, this new novel coronavirus. And indeed, no, it wasn't very much uh, on the table. It wasn't being discussed. But, I mean, I think that's been one of the big problems with this whole, the way uh, this conversation has gone around coronavirus, in that Mm. a lot of things have just not been discussed openly, not been debated. I've certainly found it very difficult to... um, uh, put my views out in the, in that you know as soon as we we wrote that paper we were met with an avalanche of really quite um you know um serious comments which hmm. not all of which were i mean even though they were from scientists not all of which even were, even from from colleagues of yours you mean? yes which they they were really quite um harsh i mean they uh, dismissed the model and they accused us of being irresponsible because, of course, there's this sort of sense that going into lockdown is this enormously sort of mm. community. Well, uh, kind of... Other comparisons aside, it's, it's, it mm. sounds a little bit like the debate around climate change, actually. Yes, it is, I think. I think the language... Some is... people say something, some, some things that uh, to the effect of, the, well, this is a big problem but maybe it's not the end of the world then they're accused of being uh, irresponsible like you say yes I think the language is very similar um, you know when you talk about climate change deniers and COVID deniers I mean it, it's very interesting I mean that that there's this sense of um, authority and, and of virtue that's associated with certain positions which has taken I guess the place of religion um, oh yes, you, yeah. I, I, I saw that you were referring to that in another interview just recently, mm-hmm. and you said that uh, something to the effect of that um, um, the way some people seem to simply not accept that this 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 virus exists really is semi-religious. What do you what do you mean by that? Can you oh, uh, d- what you just articulated so so well yourself, um, which is that you know that the whole position is is of uh, towards us that there some of the criticism is very much couched in terms of us being in denial of this enormous threat that is about to sort of enormous problem that's about to befall um you know mankind and that the only res- to which the only response can be to wear masks and lock down um, and to, I mean, the, the extent that herd immunity has suddenly become this very emotive word. I mean, it's just mm. a technical concept. I mean, mm. why is herd immunity the herd immunity crowd? <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> what do you, what, what, where do you think this reaction comes now? What, what, what do you think this happens now? This extreme uh, reaction to to a to a virus. I mean, we have had so many viruses over the years and we've had pandemics before we had the ebola pandemic or maybe epidemic or it was a, if it was a pandemic i can't really see well i it. suppose i mean um, and and then the, 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 there was not not even the, the the countries the affected countries in west africa they were in lockdown not even then and mm-hmm. i mean ebola is a really really serious yeah, it's a really thing serious. but now 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 all of a sudden this this happens like the whole world has gone yes i, I don't quite I mean, it, it's very interesting how it happened. I mean, if you just look at the history of lockdown and what lockdown means, I mean, 
because lockdowns, of course, um, initially, I mean, there's several ways in which you can um, think about what a lockdown does. And the first thing a lockdown could do is stop a virus from getting out. And that's, a, I think, quite a reasonable position to take. And um, as such, I think even in Italy, I mean, certainly in Wuhan, but even in Italy, the initial implementation of lockdown, I felt the language or the, the rationale seemed to be, we don't want it to get out of Lombardy. We don't want it to affect all of Europe, which is laudable. That's fine. You know, that, that's a very selfless thing to do. And then it, the, it suddenly turned from being that selfless act to being the selfish act, and I will use that word, of mm. locking down to prevent the virus from getting in, which is mm. not, you know, you, you can justify it. I'm not saying, you know, obviously national interest can, you know, countries are founded on the basis of national interest. So you could say, look, I'm going to lock my country down because that's, I'm the prime minister and that's what I owe my people. But you, sh if you do that, you should apologize. You shouldn't, you know, uphold it as some sort of virtuous thing you're doing. Because what you're doing is you're, you're implementing a policy that only caters to the people within the boundaries of your nation. And what I found very disappointing in all of this is a complete lack of internationalism in the response. So locking down your country to prevent it from getting in, I think is a very nationalistic um, way of doing things. Um, and I don't understand why people have, um, you know, been upheld as sort of paragons of virtue mm. for, for doing that. And then finally, the third thing with lockdown that people th thought was possible was somehow to um, eliminate the virus. And, and that's, um, I think, quite That's not really possible, is it? It's just not possible. It's just not even practical. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, there are all sorts of nuances to this. Maybe there's a rationale for locking down for a short period of time that's sustainable um, over a particular period where the hospital's being overwhelmed, you know, to, to kind of buy some time on that to get more data. You know, there, there are reasons, obviously, to perhaps do it for a short period if it's something that doesn't harm the economically vulnerable um, to a large extent. But, the, you know, the, these uh, are considerations. I mean, in fact, if one were to, able to lock down for a period after herd immunity thresholds have been reached, um, you could perhaps prevent some excess deaths in that time period. Um, so, you know, I mean, all of these issues are not black and white, but they need to be discussed. Mm. Properly, not not with some sort of evangelical zeal that we've mm. seen that is evident in, in all social media, of course, but just in any kind of discourse. Couldn't agree more when you s that thing you said about nationalism and, and and lockdowns, and I've also been very disappointed and surprised uh, about the way things uh, people have reacted in, in in Europe and also politicians in the European Union. Uh, so, uh, you're talking about some kinds, some types of uh, lockdown measures that might be justified. And uh, talking about that, we may come to uh, we, we may look a little bit uh, upon Sweden. You, I'm mm -hmm. sure you know something something about uh, the Swedish uh, soft softer version of lockdown. Do you think that is a uh, uh, Variety that uh, could be justified is—is is that a, just about right, or would you say that um, even Sweden has gone too far in some respects? So, what's your take on the no, Swedish? I'm, I'm very impressed by Sweden, not just because obviously the, the policies are sort of in alignment with my gut feeling of how um, what's the most sensible and logical strategy, but also the language with which it has been adopted and delivered. You know, I, I, I'm really in favour of a, a level of humility in terms of um, instituting any such policy. So, uh, and, and the respect that has been accorded to the general public. I think all of that is is important. It's, it's all part of one package. Overall, I think, 
you know, at, at the end of it, the, the sort of underlying message of this is something we need to live with, um, you know, that this is the best way to deal with it is to protect the vulnerable. The non-alarmist message has, has really resonated very um, strongly with my own sensibilities and also the fact that, you know, mistakes were made and then, you know, Tegna will say, oh, you know, we maybe should have taken better care to ensure it didn't get into the care homes. But, you know, this mm. is the level at which I expect a mature dialogue to happen between politicians and the public. So um, I am very much in favour of the Swedish um, strategy and uh, I think it's very sensible to take some sort of precaution against personally getting infected or keeping rates a bit lower. Um, uh, but And also it's very difficult to actually know or predict what effect social distancing will have. So given that uncertainty, I would imagine some measure of, you know, reducing exposure make, makes makes sense. But, you know, it, what I like in the strategy is an acknowledgement that, you know, we have to deal with this at a level of common sense and respect and maintain perspective. Mm. So what I like about Swedish approach is that it seems to... Um, acknowledge that and and the perspective was maintained throughout and so it's it's what I've been recommending to you know cases that are yet to see yeah uh, surge in cases like Australia some of the experts that are and, and leaders that are advocating the Swedish model they say that uh one year or two years from now, the death rates will be just about the same in every country, even those who have had the harshest lockdowns. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, I should think so. I think it will settle down into an endemic pattern. Most of these uh, viruses do. And um, indeed, I think uh, that will happen. And also there's the issue of uh, countries and places that lock down, in my opinion, too early who um, will, hmm. you know, all they've done is delay the deaths. So um, they will have the, the spikes in, in, in the autumn. Well, it's then. already happening in the south of the United States, um, hmm. in, in India, um, in parts of Africa. I was just talking with a colleague from Kenya and they locked down. But again, I, I believe he was saying that the Kenyan prime minister, uh, president, well, has been... Also, you know, quite um, sensible about saying, look, you know, we did that. That's as much as we could do. And then now we have to come out of it and we're just going to have to deal with this. And mm. I mean, the truth I mean, yeah, is... I, 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 I kind of found it very, very odd that uh, countries in Africa and this, this poorest part of the world reacted in this way, in the same way as countries mm. in Europe did, when... The fact is that they are so used to having severe illnesses and, and uh, all kinds of adversities all the time, and they never locked down their countries, and all of a sudden they did. It's I know. Weird. It it's didn't make sense to me. And again, I mean, the colleague uh, with whom I was conversing in Kenya who said that malaria and all the infant um, you know, immunizations have been compromised to the point where things are just in a disastrous state, uh, which we know. We, we knew that would happen, and mm. my one of my strongest motivations in becoming vocal on this um, was not just what it was likely to do to the economically vulnerable um, people in Europe and um, so in the UK, but globally, I was really quite terrified that this would happen, mm. and unfortunately, it did. I couldn't do anything to stop it. Terrible. Would you say that lockdowns uh, might even be more detrimental to some segments of the population than, than the illness itself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's the fundamental issue. Uh, um, I mean, even in rich countries like Sweden and... Oh, and yeah, Britain. yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the already it's, it's very clear that there will be... First, even if you start... If you, start, if you look at the epidemic as sort of the one axis you're traveling on. And then, okay, it will cause deaths. Or not. And then you start to broaden out and you start looking at other infectious diseases 
that's going to suffer, obviously, because of programs not being in place and other pe people not seeking the right treatment. Non-infectious diseases, cancers, um, things that will suffer from loss of um, treatment and, and diagnosis, uh, mental health. You know, it just start as soon as you broaden your perspective, you start to realize there are all these other things that are going to be affected. But just as you know, within you're still in the public health arena, and then you broaden out further and you start to look at the economic impact on the economically vulnerable, and it's just frightening. It's absolutely frightening. Um, so well, I, I think. As far as I understand, those those issues, the economic problems, economic issues, the economic uh, uh, drawbacks from from these lockdowns uh, were obvious to to uh, officials and debaters early on. But that didn't seem to matter because all of a sudden the the politicians they just they just pulled out hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros from their pockets. Mm -hmm. Like nothing, and said that oh, we have all the money in the world for these companies to 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 yeah. borrow yeah. use yeah. because uh, <laughs> we just have to do this, and it may cost as much as it it may, and so that yes. doesn't seem but to matter. Really. Who is going to bear those costs? And of course, they're yeah. the poor who will bear those costs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, taxpayers. It's quite astonishing that it was just never, and and continues not to be part of the. The general picture when you know people do adopt this sort of language of denial and you know um, this religious semi-religious language there's mm. absolutely like I mean many religions there's no acknowledgement of the wider world in which these arguments need to be situated mm. and and that I think that's that's very very worrying so it, it is really um, a big issue. Yeah, before we, we come back a little bit to the philosophical side of it, uh, going back to your studies here, um, you were talking about, uh, I mean, you have you have found that uh, immunity can be probably achieved in ways that we haven't really still understood. And uh, studies in Stockholm, in Sweden, have shown that um, a fair amount of people have antibodies now, but far fewer than many expe experts had anticipated and hoped for. And but even so, the numbers of infection and the numbers of of deaths are are um, falling fairly significantly. Is that a proof of your findings that well, there is that some kind of immunity that that you can't really measure in with uh, looking for antibody antibodies? Well, what we humbly aim to do, I think, as, as theoreticians, is kind of to take the data and, and find a hypothesis that, that fits it. So I wouldn't say it proves what we believe. It's just what we have recently put out is an exercise that allows us to piece together these bits of the puzzle. So on the one hand, um, that it's clearly the deaths are going down. That suggests the epidemic is over, so something must be stopping it from increasing. And yet, people do not. We don't see the high levels of antibody positivity that you'd expect um, and that people believe are required for herd immunity, which is what would be driving. So the there is something else at play. So there is something else at play, which pe several people have mentioned, uh, not just us, but what we did is set up a simple model which took into account the um, you know the evidence that's now coming through that, as you say, some people are resistant. And so in the model, what we show is what happens to that threshold of herd immunity when a proportion of the population is resistant, and also what you would expect to measure by way of seropositivity in the population under those circumstances. And all we do is... Seropositivity is the, the level of, of people ha uh, having, having antibodies. antibodies. And, and that is also contingent on, first of all, how good the antibody test is and also how long the antibodies last, the ones that you're trying to detect. So what we've done is just all we do, are doing, and I think all we can do as theoreticians, is just set out um, you know, a, a set of relationships, really, between these things. And what we show with that is that 
one thing that would agree with all of these is that there's a substantial fraction of people immune um, and that we have now exceeded the threshold, which brings the threshold down more than just as a fraction. So it's not just, so it has a disproportionate effect on the threshold. It lowers it even further than just by a half, for example. So if mm. half the population is immune, that threshold is lowered by more than a half. Okay. Is what paper shows. And so then you just, you have this sort of map, if you like. That's all we did. We lay, laid out a map in front of um, people who wish to consider it, just showing how you can link proportion resistant uh, with the sort of fundamental transmissibility of the pathogen, which this concept of R0 that people are banding around. Um, yeah. We know that that must fall somewhere in between, you know, maybe the lowest value would be maybe 1.5 or something, or 1.25, we don't know. And the highest maybe 2.5, but something, well, we so we show the whole range from one to three of that. And then we show a range from zero to 50% of people being resistant. And mm. then from that, you can deduce what the herd immunity threshold will be and mm. whether we have reached it. Uh, typically what happens in an epidemic is you exceed that threshold because you're already running. So you exceed that threshold uh, and then, so infections start to drop when you hit that threshold, but they continue to occur. And then it stabilizes at, as a, uh, stabilizes at a kind of final size and goes away for a bit. And then it comes back again when more susceptible people accumulate because they're being born or people are losing their immunity, um, mm. et cetera. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, what well, all we're saying is one way to reconcile, put all this together, the fact that infections are dropping in Stockholm, in London, in New York, despite the fact that, you know, we don't see 70% of people presenting with antibodies. One way to, or at least the framework in which to view that, should really now include the proportion who are resistant to infection, either mm -hmm. because of previous exposure to seasonal coronaviruses, or just because our immune, some people just have innate immune defenses that allow them to um, resist infection. Mm. Well, ho fascinating findings. Hopefully, this will spread uh, more now in the future, in the near future. Well, I uh, just stop people from just throwing out these numbers, tossing yeah. out numbers, saying, well, whatever, we have not reached herd immunity. Well, we don't know that. It no. depends on how many people are. Sure. And then, of course, there's the, there's the vaccine. Yes. And, you, you know, there are so many conspiracy mm -hmm. theories around uh, this production of the vaccine mm -hmm. and whether or not it should be uh, mandatory and all that. Uh, but considering what you are saying now, your findings uh, about immunity and uh, possible herd immunity and and uh, uh, and immunity that that can't really be detected very clearly, but is still there, is it even? I mean, could you could you could we do we even need a vaccine eventually? Can we weather this through without actually introducing a vaccine in the end? Um, I, I think we can weather it through, but obviously we can do better than that. And a vaccine would be highly desirable um, to do what I think is our duty, which is to protect the vulnerable population. And uh, I think um, vac a vaccine would be a very good thing because it it would protect, it could protect potentially the um, vulnerable people directly, or it could protect them indirectly by reducing the risk of infection to them in, in the people that they regularly see. Okay, so, so it would be something to be used as... In a sensible way, it's a very mm. good thing to be doing. It shouldn't be too difficult to develop a vaccine to this virus because it's um, it's not a very complicated virus and it doesn't keep changing all the time like flu or it doesn't have really cunning ways of hiding like herpes or... HIV. So it should be straightforward. And, you know, there are many promising candidates. So uh, I, yeah, I just now, I've, just today, I read, I read about uh, the first, I think the first human vaccine trial um, conducted at your university. Yes, um, indeed. Um, with encouraging results. 
yes, I think uh, that that vaccine was able to um, produce antibodies in, in people, and um, we'll have to see how protective they are. But I'm sure that they will protect at least against some severity of disease or something. Um, mm. So, and then, uh, no, so I have no, I don't think that there's any issue with the development of vaccines. I think it's, okay. it's always a good thing. Excellent. Um, uh, it seems as if there's a lot of uh, psychology behind our behavior, as we have been talking about today uh, around this issue. and. Um, Perhaps the psychology is even the main driver here. Professor Carol Sikora, I don't know if he's an epidemiologist. I don't think so. I, th I think he's something different. Um, he, he, um, yeah, I think he uh, is an immunologist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, I heard him in an interview saying something very interesting. He said, the pandemic is over when we decide it's over. Uh, I found that very Interesting. I kind of think I know what he means. What do you, how do you interpret that? Well, I think I think he's been wonderfully articulate and sensible, um, and I've really welcomed having his voice um, in all of this, um, um, as I have with many of your Swedish experts, um, taking mm. himself. And I don't know how do I pronounce them. Giseke. 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 We've had Teng Tengnell. Tengnell. <laughs> okay. You know, I used to work, watch a lot of Bergman films, but <laughs> yes, <doesn't make> sense, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, exactly because the, the, it's there's a sort of perceived threat, mm. and it's been very interesting to see how people um, the, the language of that has coloured um, how we react to it. So, for example, one of the things I suddenly realised that because I couldn't understand why people are so intent on locking down. Um, and what I realized is people think of the threat as independent of us. Mm. So they think of it like a hurricane. Mm -hmm. So it's coming, we batten down the hatches. Ex external it, force. Yeah, yeah, it's an external force. So then, then it goes and then we, we reopen. So there's a fundamental misconception there about our relationship with the virus. Um, and so that's one thing. And then the second thing is it, the conversation seems to not include any recognition of our relationship with other viruses and other pathogens that claim so many lives. So clearly, um, you know, to go back to what uh, Carol Sikora said, um, with those viruses, we've decided there is no mm. problem with flu. You know, because they're, 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 eventually it's there's a fatigue, isn't it? I mean, but it's not. Just, I mean, it's how we live our lives. We don't say, "Oh God, twenty thousand people are going to die of flu." This no. year, we'd better start wearing masks. We don't do that. So I know exactly what he means. If we decide, mm. you know, coronavirus is part of our lives, um, as we have done with many of these diseases, including HIV, for example. You know, I mean, yeah. it's. Um, it is very. We learn how to live with it. We've learned how to live with it mm. uh, because it's not. It's very difficult to eliminate diseases or eradicate them. Mm. I mean, let's face it: smallpox is the only disease we've managed to eradicate. Uh, even yeah. measles, for which we have a fantastic vaccine, and in mm. countries where we have a well, despite all the anti-vaxxer stuff, mm. um, we have really good uptake in many countries. Still haven't got rid of measles. I mean, Polio is, is really vaccine. close close to being eradicated, isn't it? Polio, Polio is close to being eradicated. But, you know, um, if we can keep the death rates down as best we can, to the best of our abilities, I think uh, we will have done a good job. And, you know, I, I, I hopefully it is a matter of time before we just sort of start to think of this as, all right, this is just part of our lives. And mm. I completely agree with uh, Professor Sikora that this yeah. is... Okay. Uh, uh, I won't take up your time very much longer now. It's been a fantastic uh, conversation, a fantastic conversation. I just have one final question. I have to tell the, the audience that you are also a novelist. You're a writer. You write uh, fictional books. How many, how many books have you written? Well, I'm, uh, I've written... Um, Six. Um, so the sixth six novels. One is about to be uh, 
um, sent out to publishers, I've had to kind of put uh, sort of uh, delay that a little bit because of, of all this work on on COVID. But um, yes, um, that is. Then I, yeah, I think that I'll makes you an excellent person to kind of look at things uh, from a storyteller's perspective. So I I was going to ask you finally if we look uh, a year ahead or maybe two years ahead we kind of visualize the world two years from now or one year from now what will what would you say will have unfolded how will this whole corona thing have played out in the end and what will we have learned primarily well um i'm hoping that in two years time coronavirus will just become or this particular coronavirus will just become part of the suite of seasonal coronaviruses that we deal with. Um, and that looking back on this, uh, hopefully we will learn um, several lessons. We will hopefully have learnt um, that you cannot deal with any threat on a, the single axis of that threat itself. That no matter how large it is, You have to consider, unless it's a meteorite coming towards the Earth, you have to really think about the implications of um, how you respond on all other sectors of life. That, that That's important. I hope we will learn that the language of um, dealing with these threats needs to be more sophisticated. So I think one of the problems we've had is that people don't speak um, or they've forgotten to ha how to have a nuanced conversation. So it's all about um, orders and you know, mandates and, and very, very um, the, the whole vision is, is very um, one dimensional on it. So we need to have more um, broader conversations around it. And maybe on the sort of upside of how we've had to live in many countries, we will Um, take away some messages about how we can live more fulfilled and enriching lives by um, limiting some of the sort of activities that we undertake, like, you know, some of the rat races that we engage in are mm. maybe not absolutely central to, to the functioning of the economy. So um, I'm still that. A silver, lining, a silver lining? There might be a silver lining there. Uh, and we hopefully will learn how crucial it is to invest in healthcare systems. And I mean, one of the problems I think we had in the UK was that for the last 30 years we've been impoverishing the National Health Service. Um, so hopefully we'll learn that we need to be prepared for pandemics by having a very good National Health Service in place. Mm. Excellent, excellent uh, conclusions there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for taking time to speaking to Mind the Shift. And hopefully your work will be acknowledged more and spread more from now on, because well, this is really important work that you're doing. Can get through this without more suffering on um, yes. a global level. Okay. Let's hope. Let's hope. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Sanjay Gupta. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Bye. You.